Well, thank you for coming to our third and of seven talks that Richard Norton Smith is presenting to our university community. We're so happy to see Grand Forum here as well and many people from the community. Uh, I've already introduced Richard more formally. Uh, he needs no introduction to this audience. Uh, you know him well. This hour he will be speaking about a very tantalizing topic, uh, the lies that the presidents tell and why they do that. And I just would like to remind you at the end of his uh, formal presentation of remarks, when he opens it up to Q&A, feel free to walk up to one of the two microphones at the front of the room. This is being recorded and that way everybody will be able to hear you and we'll have you on camera as well. So I appreciate that. One other little housekeeping. We've had some phone calls come in in previous lectures, and so if you would be so kind as to turn off your cell phones, that would be appreciated as well. Without further ado, Richard Norton Smith, the Presidential Lies. Thank you, Glees. Great to see you all. Oh, there's one. Um, this is a great turnout. We decided, since so many people are interested in Presidential Lies, we decided. Next year we're going to call the series just sex. Uh, and Lord knows how many people uh, they might be coming out the door. Um, anyway, thank you. I see a lot of returning faces. Uh, um, I'm holding in my hand the New York Times for October 7th of this year. And uh, the headline reads, Law on Lies by Politicians is Found Unconstitutional. Uh, I'm not making this up. Um, <laughs> the Washington Supreme Court, turns out there are more than a dozen states in this country that actually have laws on the statute books that make it unlawful to say false things about political candidates. Um, anyway, on October 7th, by a 5-4 to four vote, the Washington Supreme Court added Oh, it just uh, declared that the, the law of that state was unconstitutional. The notion that the government rather than the people may be the final arbiter of truth in political debate is fundamentally at odds with the First Amendment. A dissenting justice wrote, the majority's decision is an invitation to lie with impunity. <laughs> anyway, it was the Washington Supreme Court, not the Supreme Court in Washington, that uh, ruled that. But. Uh, Anyway, lying with impunity matters less than if you get away with it, I guess, um, which is one of the lessons of, of history. The, um, it's a sensitive subject, actually. We're laughing about it. But uh, in many ways, it goes to the heart of, I think, maybe the current dismay, suspicion, skepticism, bordering on cynicism that so many people feel about government, generally. Um, in the British House of Commons, you can't even pronounce the word why. Um, Churchill famously came up with a, a very Churchillian alternative. Uh, he, he referred to a terminological inexactitude, <laughs> <laughs> which uh, must be kind of nice. Um, we, we like to think all of our presidents are like George Washington, who, as we all know, couldn't tell a lie. Mark Twain once said, you know, I'm a greater man than George Washington, because he couldn't tell a lie, and I can. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> In fact, George Washington was a very deft liar. Um, after the revolution, when he went back to Mount Vernon, well, he, he was he was oppressed, as you might imagine, to write his war memoirs. And um, he said that he really, um, you know, did want did not want to do that. He didn't want people to ascribe vanity to him. In fact, he was very sensitive about his um, relative lack of formal education. <laughs> Interesting thing is, first thing he did when he got back to Mount Vernon was take out all of his old letter books and correct the syntax and grammar before it could be copied for posterity. So, I don't know, maybe he lied to himself. Um, Jimmy Carter, of course, famously said that he would never lie to us. Uh, he might have done better if he had. <laughs> um, <laughs> There are lies and there are lies, as we all know. Um, for presidents, they're almost an unavoidable part of the business, um, particularly in wartime. There are campaign promises, which is another whole category 
of itself. If we were, if we were talking about that, we'd be here all afternoon. Um, is, is it a lie for Herbert Hoover's supporters to promise a chicken in every pot? Um, prosperity, as far as the eye can see, in 1928. Is it a lie for Woodrow Wilson's supporters and the president himself to say he kept us out of war? Uh, as a uh, justification for reelecting him to a second term. I suppose technically it's not. He didn't say he'll keep us out of war. The slogan was, he kept us out of war. Um, Franklin Roosevelt, in the last days of the 1940 campaign, a very close race, actually, against uh, Wendell Wilkie, charismatic candidate. Harold Ickes famously referred to him as uh, um, the barefoot boy from Wall Street. Um, actually from a small town in Indiana, and he ran FDR uh, a close race uh, at a time when Europe was uh, being consumed by war, and the great overriding issue that no one really wanted to confront was, were there circumstances under which this country would be dragged into war? And uh, FDR, who was a genius at splitting hairs, and sometimes infinitives, um, in the last days of the campaign, uh, told uh, famously told an audience in Boston that your boys are not going to be sent to fight in foreign wars. And within weeks, of course, basically it changed the, the, the tone and substance of his comments. Uh, and he had an explanation. He's talking about foreign wars. If we were attacked, that wouldn't be a foreign war. We would simply be responding to a foreign invader, which of course is precisely what happened. Harry Truman is the personification of plain-spoken Midwestern uh, veracity, and I, I think that's, uh, that's accurate most of the time. Um, but the Korean War, which erupted in June 1950, represented the uh, inversion of a policy. Um, at Dean Acheson, who was Secretary of State, and, and Truman's strong right arm went to the National Press Club and gave a speech in which basically he used a map of the world and a map of Asia and he said quite pointedly that the Korean Peninsula was outside the perimeter of America's defense interests. Now, to this day, historians are debating did that unwittingly give a green light to the, uh, to the North Koreans? Um, literally, we don't know. Um, needless to say, Truman was quick to disavow it once the invasion from the North actually occurred. And then, of course, most recently, in fact, if you want to really trace, in my opinion, uh, if you want to trace to the origins, the cynicism that we feel about government, the inherent, I think, suspicion that many Americans um, harbor for their leaders, it really goes back 40 years to Lyndon Johnson and the credibility gap. And the reason there was a credibility gap was Lyndon Johnson was, uh, he was not economical with taxpayer dollars, but he could be very economical with the truth. Um, in 1964, famously, uh, the Gulf of Tonkin incident, about which uh, there is still a debate raging as to whether exactly there was one attack or two attacks. Um, but there's no doubt that LBJ seized upon this relatively modest incident involving a, a, a North Vietnamese uh, PT boat, in effect, and a much larger American, or a series of American vessels, uh, to justify the expansion of the war. Uh, there's a kind of lie involved in telling the American people that you can have it all. And Lyndon Johnson didn't pioneer it, um, and he didn't end it. <laughs> uh, the notion that you can have guns and butter that you can have it all, that the government can do it all, uh, that you can do it all, that we can fight wars against poverty and wars in Southeast Asia. Um, but what is really disturbing, I think, is if you look at the, if you listen to the Johnson tapes, and I know some of you may have heard some of them on C-SPAN radio or, or, or in other formats, they're absolutely fascinating because the agony that Lyndon Johnson felt, LBJ said that um, it's a, uh, not, not difficult for a president to do the right thing. What's hard is for a president to know what the right thing is to do.